sometimes a great risk and a great opportunity comes from the most unlikely of places. Now, let me begin by saying that we're not, in fact, rich enough for this. Sorry, my slides aren't coming up here. <laughs> there we go. Just working out the ticks here. Okay, so let me begin by saying that we're not, in fact, rich enough for this. But at the same time, we're rich because of this. And this is a neighborhood in Toronto and Scarborough. This may not look fancy to you, but this is, in fact, very expensive infrastructure. On a poorer household basis, there are roads, sewers, street lights. There's toilets, of course, in every one of those homes that in most instances doesn't flush all day long because most of those homes are empty all day long. And the roads are plowed and the sidewalks, if people get out and shovel them, the, the sidewalks are shoveled. But in fact, that infrastructure is sitting empty, unused, aging all day long. This is both a risk and an opportunity. And it's a risk in part because we know that a significant amount of money has been spent in the past on building this infrastructure, and we now have an infrastructure deficit, and we have a challenge in building new infrastructure. And we've already heard some of the big numbers being tossed around with respect to billions and billions of dollars that we need to spend on new infrastructure to serve our communities, but we also know that the 2009 recession in the States was in fact as a result of a whole variety of reasons, but two really big ones that we can't ignore. And one of them is that people were buying housing that they couldn't afford at a very basic level. People, individuals were buying houses that they simply couldn't afford. At the same time, the second big idea that goes alongside of that is that governments were subsidizing infrastructure that they could not afford to operate and maintain over the long term. And in fact, governments were facilitating the myth that everyone could afford something that in fact they couldn't. We now know that. Now, I say that we're rich because of this infrastructure, because we have made investments that present an opportunity if we plan in a fundamentally different way forward to generate much more and shared prosperity for all. So the challenge is, are we going to see this infrastructure as something that presents us with an opportunity to redefine the way we live in a way that is, in fact, more sustainable? So uh, let's just see how much of an issue this really is. What's the big deal? So we've got a few suburbs. Well, in fact, we know as a result of some wonderful research that's been undertaken by Professor David Gordon at the University, at Queen's University, that in fact 82% of Canadians live in these underutilized suburbs. We know that this is in fact a defining characteristic of our country. Low density suburbs that have all kinds of costs. We know that it costs the average Canadian about $10,000 a year to own a car. You have to own the car to drive to work, to pay for the car. But we know that when we plan our infrastructure in this way, we really take away a lot of choice in terms of how you move. Because you are, in fact, required to get in your car and drive anywhere that you want to go. Suburban sprawl is, in fact, the norm in our country. But it cannot be the norm in terms of how we live moving forward in the future. There are real costs to our cities, and there's real costs to us as individuals. We need only look at rising childhood obesity, ri rising adult obesity, which is directly correlated and linked to the fact that we've created communities where we've designed activity out. We've designed walking out of our communities by not mixing up uses, mixing up housing types in a way that puts destinations within walking distance. This is a great risk, 
but the opportunity is how we redefine this in the future. Now, I'm from Toronto, and uh, when you think of Toronto, and if you've been there lately, you know we are doing this incredible thing in our downtown core. Toronto is 613 square kilometers, but our downtown is only 17 square kilometers. And in the downtown, we are in fact the, one of the fastest growing areas in North America. In August alone, City Council approved over 700 stories of new development in that 17 square kilometers, that very urban part of the city. Why does this matter? We are seeing a tremendous amount of growth in the most urban part of our city precisely because of the opportunity to walk to work, to live near cultural amenities, to take a bike or a short transit ride to get the, all of the amenities that you need as part of your everyday life. But the vast majority of Toronto is in fact a suburban city, not unlike the vast majority of our country, and therein lies our greatest opportunity to become something different. Now, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about here. Here's, um, here's Barcelona, shown to scale, and Barcelona has a population of about just over 5 million people, and the built area is 162 kilometers squared, so pretty much half the land area of the city of Toronto. And then let me show you uh, another city, now, these two cities are on the far end of the spectrum in terms of extremes. Barcelona is very dense, and we know Atlanta is the poster child for sprawling cities. It's, it's very, very sprawling. Well, think about the infrastructure costs. Both of these cities provide services and amenities to the same amount of population. But in fact, they take up a fundamentally different land area. And here's the real kicker. We know that as a result, the environmental footprint of residents who live in Barcelona is a fraction of the environmental footprint of people who live in Atlanta. That is because of the way infrastructure has been designed and planned and the implication that the designing and planning of that, implication, uh, that infrastructure has on how people move about. We need to think carefully and critically if we're serious about addressing climate change, we need to think about the kinds of places that we plan and design and the implications for how we move in those cities that we plan and design. And we know there are a whole variety of drivers for planning and designing differently. But the argument that I would like to make for you today is that one of the most important drivers is that we've already built out all kinds of infrastructure that we need in our suburbs. And we have an opportunity, instead of planning and designing more of the same, to utilize that infrastructure and to build something that is, in fact, fundamentally different. This is all about using the assets that we have built up over many generations to redefine our environmental footprint, but also to create walkable, livable communities. Now, I've uh, got up on the screen here um, our, transit, our transit infrastructure plan, and there's two things I want to point out to you that are important here, the green lines and the black lines. For a very important reason, we have rail corridors in our city, regional rail corridors. We are embarking on an exercise in transitioning those rail corridors and significantly increasing the capacity to move passengers. The black line is Smart Track, which is all about adding more service and more stations so that more people can get into that rail corridor and use it as a form of transportation. Now, what's important about this is that it is not so sexy to talk about using infrastructure that already exists. It's really tricky to cut the ribbon. It doesn't shine so much. But we have important infrastructure in our cities across Canada that we can adapt for new uses. And by adapting that infrastructure for new uses, we can capitalize on the investments that we've already made. 
This is a critical part of thinking differently about the assets that we have in our community and the role that they will play in redefining our cities. Take schools as another example. You know, we have this big debate going on in Ontario and it's of course going on in jurisdictions across Canada. We build our sprawling suburbs and we build no new schools in those suburbs. And what happens to our schools that already exist? Let's close those down. Let's sell them, demolish them, and build housing or condos as a revenue source, right? Isn't that a good plan? Those existing schools are a critical community asset. They are already a critical community benefit that we as a society have invested in over many years. By sprawling our infrastructure, we're abandoning the infrastructure we already have. By directing our growth to built up areas, we can embrace the infrastructure that exists in those built up areas. Another example is taking advantage of our urban open spaces. You see here our ravine system in the city of Toronto. We're adding lots of density. Uh, we're putting new buildings everywhere in the city. Uh, we don't have a big pot of gold to be going out and buying new parks as we densify existing neighborhoods. But we have a ravine system. And if we recognize the magnitude of the asset that this ravine system is to our city, we will focus on building points of access, connection points. In environmentally sensitive areas, we'll add boardwalks and trails. We'll recognize our ravine system as being a critical existing asset that with a little bit of investment, a little bit of planning, can in fact transform how we live in urban places. Now lastly, I'm just going to give you an example of what is probably the most important way that we can transform our cities into walkable, complete communities, and it's this. It's by turning our arterials, our roads, into streets. By making our roads, and roads are really about getting from point A to B. You get on a road because you're going somewhere, but a street is a destination. A street has life and activity of its own. A street is sometimes a neighborhood. A street sometimes has commercial activities happening at grade. If we start thinking about our streets, and in the city of Toronto, about 25% of our land area are roads. When we start thinking about them as streets, we transform them into something different. So you see here Eglinton, this is adjacent to that single family neighborhood that I showed you that doesn't really have a lot of destinations within walking distance. But imagine if five minutes away, your road, that's really just sort of good for driving in your car, actually became a place. Imagine if that road infrastructure was transformed in such a way through intensification and the integration of various forms of transportation, such as cycling, nice sweeping wide sidewalks so it's a beautiful place to walk, adding green infrastructure that can mitigate the stormwater or flooding. Imagine that road that was only sort of good for driving in the past, and remember that road already has electrical, it already has sewers, there's already been an investment in the hard infrastructure. Imagine if we adapt that and we turn it into something that can serve a community and can provide a new neighborhood, a new place for people to live and to thrive. This, uh, this is where we're investing in 19 kilometers of LRT. And as a result of that investment in LRT, we are transforming right through the heart of Toronto in, on Eglinton Avenue. We are transforming our roads into streets. We're using that existing asset and we're transforming it because at the end of the day, we're actually pretty rich. But how we plan will determine whether we have shared prosperity for all in the future. Thank you.